Good morning, and welcome to Lebanon Presbyterian Church. I'm John, and I'm happy to have uh, Randy Fannin assisting us in the service this morning. It's great to see all of you here. Please listen to these important reminders. Tonight, a gathering of prayer will take place at 6 p.m. There's something else taking place. But anyway, um, we will be gathering at 6 p.m. in the narthex. The Messiah uh, Sunday School class will resume meeting at 9.45 a.m. today in Fellowship Hall, room 101, with Roger McMurrin. Just two God Space workshops remain with Doug Pollock this Wednesday and next Wednesday in the ark preceded by a meal for all. Kids ministry will also be meeting. A warm friendly welcome to those of you who are visiting with us today. Uh, we would like you to um, secure from one of our ushers a get connected card, fill it out, turn it in, get a free gift. Now that's a deal. In just a few moments, we will be challenged by our pastor, Peter, as he shines a light on the purpose of prayer. There is, in this place, possibility. Let us meditate on the prelude. Thank you, Rick and Terry. I invite you now to rise as we join our voices and hearts together in the call to worship. Shout for joy to God all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Make his praise glorious. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies cringe. All the earth bows down to you. They sing praise to you. They sing praises to your name. 
praise our God, all peoples. Let the sound of his praise be heard. I cried out to him with my mouth. His praise was on my tongue. Praise be to God, who has not rejected my prayer or withheld his love from me. You may be seated. As we turn to the prayer of confession found in your worship guide, let us confess our sins and shortcomings before God, who is eager to answer and forgive. Let us pray together. Almighty and eternal God, we thank you for the miracle of prayer. Through faith in Jesus Christ, we are your children. As your children, we can enter boldly into your presence. By your Holy Spirit, we are able to speak with the creator of the universe, with the assurance that you hear and answer. Forgive us, Lord, for our lack of prayer. Forgive us for lives that are self-willed. Forgive us for prayers that are self-centered. Forgive us for prayers in which we speak but do not listen. Forgive us for praying only in times of crisis. Forgive us for doubting the power of prayer. By your Holy Spirit, teach us how to pray Help us understand that to walk with you, we must walk with you. By your grace, may we desire and delight in prayer. We pray in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. As we remain at the throne of our Savior, 
let us confess our personal shortcomings. Amen. As he has set us free from sin and fear, he will rekindle in each of you a passion for the work that needs to be done. Night always gives way to the dawn. War always gives way to peace. Death is always shattered by life. God is always doing a new thing. Every minute of every day, God is at work around us and within us. For the homeless, for the hungry, for the thirsty, for the weary, for the lonely, for the sick. Every minute of every day, God is making all things new, giving and giving and giving again. And we are called to be part of that generosity. We are called to give, to surrender our time, talent, and treasure to this God work of making all things new. We are called to give. We are called to give. Let us pray. Loving God, through our giving, help make real what your prophets declare, that mourning and crying and pain will be no more. With our very lives, make this a world where everyone is loved where justice and compassion roll down like a mighty stream, where death is no more, where mourning and crying and pain are no more. We pray, do it now, God, in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And the people of God said, Amen.
Good morning. I wish I was able to be with you in worship this morning, but unfortunately I am in quarantine. Beth and I went on a trip last week to visit some family. We had a great vacation, but uh, for seven days now I've got to spend in quarantine. Uh, we're fine. None of us are sick. We're all healthy. We have no symptoms. So uh, I'm sorry to be missing worship this morning. Sorry I'm not with you, but I pray uh, God, in spite of this, will speak his word and speak his message to us. It's a word about prayer. Uh, Jesus teaches us how to pray. Our scripture comes from Matthew 6 and starting at verse 5. So listen to the life-changing word of God. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like the pagans, for they think they'll be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven... Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors, 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Will you pray with me? Lord, we thank you for the great, great gift of prayer that through faith in you, Lord Jesus Christ, we have access to the throne of God, the ear of God, who's always listening and attentive to our prayers. Thank you, Lord, for the gift of prayer and teach us, Lord, how to pray. And may your word come with power and assurance of your Holy Spirit, Lord Jesus. Amen. There's a story about a man who received a telescope as a gift. And he'd never seen a telescope before, he'd never owned one, um, so he had no idea how to use it. So when he looked into the telescope, he had it backwards. Instead of looking through the small end, the small lens, he looked through the big end, the big lens. And of course, that doesn't work. So finally, the man gave up in frustration and he threw the telescope in the trash. Of course, there was nothing wrong with the telescope at all. The problem was that the man had it backwards. I believe prayer is like that telescope. Prayer is an amazing gift given by God. Through prayer, we receive comfort and guidance and power and peace. Through prayer, we draw close to God and experience his presence in our lives. Through prayer, we receive power for living, supernatural power. Prayer is an amazing gift, but the problem is many people don't know how to use this gift. Many Christians even don't know how to pray. Like the telescope, they have it backwards. What is prayer? How do we pray? The Gospel of Luke 11, verse 1, it says, One day Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he finished, one of the disciples came to him and said, Lord, teach us to pray. Now that is strange and surprising, because the disciples of Jesus were Jewish. They had grown up in a culture of prayer. The Jews are a people of prayer. Prayers are recited at mealtime and the Sabbath and the holy days. Day and night prayers were recited in the temple and the synagogue. Uh, the Jews were a culture steeped in prayer. You would think the disciples would already know how to pray. And yet the disciples came to Jesus and said, teach us how to pray. You see, when Jesus prayed, it was different. It was not like any prayers that they'd ever heard before. When Jesus prayed, it was not a religious ritual. When Jesus prayed, it was a conversation with God. It was fresh. It was alive. It was real. It didn't take long for the disciples to figure that out. They wanted to pray like Jesus. And so Jesus taught them how to pray. I think of all the lessons that Jesus taught his disciples in the Gospels, maybe this is the most important of all the lessons that he taught them, the lesson how to pray. What is prayer? What does Jesus teach and tell us about prayer? First, Jesus begins with negative examples, how not to pray. In verse 5, Jesus says, Do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on street corners to be seen by men. That word hypocrite in Greek, that is a drama term. It's a theater term. A hypocrite was an actor who wears and puts on a mask during a performance. It might be the mask of tragedy or the mask of comedy, but a hypocrite is an actor who wears a mask. For some people... Prayer is a performance. It has nothing to do with God. It is self-conscious. It is driven by ego. There's a story about Thomas Merton, who served as a Catholic monk. At one point, he announced his intention to become a hermit. And of course, that sounds very godly and pious to renounce the world, to deny the world, and uh, to live a life of prayer and meditation and seclusion, to become a hermit. But a friend who knew him very well said to him, Thomas, what you really want is to be a hermit in the middle of Times Square with a flashing neon sign that says, Hermit praying here, hermit praying here. You see, prayer can be like that. It can become a performance, something we're doing to impress people with how godly we are and how spiritual we are. And that kind of prayer has very little value. Frankly, I've been in some prayer meetings like that where it seemed like a performance. 
people trying to pray in an impressive way to impress other people. I think especially for a pastor, that is a great temptation to pray impressive prayers that will impress people, to make it a performance. But Jesus tells us, do not pray like that. Don't pray like the hypocrites. When you pray, in other words, don't fake it. Be genuine, be honest, be sincere, be real, be yourself when you pray. Don't be like the hypocrites. Also at verse 7, a negative example, Jesus says, And when you pray, don't keep babbling like the pagans who think that they'll be heard because of their many words. Again here, a negative example, don't pray like the pagans. The pagans were Greeks and Romans, not Jewish people, who worshipped uh, the Greek and Roman gods, Zeus, Apollo, Aphrodite, Hermes. Uh, they pray to a statue made of gold or silver or of stone. The pagans believed two things. First, they believed that prayer is how you gain favor with the gods. If I pray to Zeus and Apollo or Aphrodite, they'll reward me because of my prayers, like a point system. Of course, as Christians, we don't believe that at all. With God, everything is a gift of his grace. When we pray, we're not trying to earn points with God or or gain his favor. <laughs> we pray just purely out of love in response to his grace. Also, the pagans believe that prayer really depends on us. If my prayers are effective or not, it's really all up to me and how I pray. I remember once I was watching a parade in Indianapolis, and a famous actor was passing by in a convertible. It was Jim Neighbors who played Gomer Pyle in the old TV show. And as loud as I could, as Jim Neighbors was passing by, I shouted out, Shazam! Of course, that was the signature phrase of Gomer Pyle, Shazam! And in that moment, Jim Neighbors heard my voice, he heard me shouting, and he turned, and he looked at me, and he smiled, and he waved, and it made my day. For the pagans, prayer was like that. If you prayed long enough, if you prayed loud enough, if you shouted, maybe then the gods would hear you. But you had to get their attention. Otherwise, your prayers would not be heard. But of course, prayer does not depend on us. The Bible tells us God is always listening and attentive. <laughs> In Isaiah 65, verse 24, the Lord says, It shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they are still speaking, I will hear. We don't have to shout for God to hear us. We don't have to babble to get his attention. Before we even speak, the Lord knows what we need. Before we even begin to pray, he knows exactly what's in our hearts. When you pray, don't babble like the pagans, for they think that they'll be heard because of their many words. What happens next in this scripture is Jesus prays. Instead of teaching them about prayer, uh, Jesus prays. He says to his disciples, this then is how you should pray. Not like the pagans, not like the hypocrites. This then is how you should pray. The striking thing about the prayer to me is it is so brief and is so short. In English, it's only 52 words. It's a very, very short prayer. In my library at church, I've got many books on prayer. In fact, I've got a whole shelf full, 20 or 30 books all about prayer. Some of them good, some of them not so good. Some of them helpful, some not so helpful. But the truth is, everything we need to know about prayer, Jesus teaches us here. It's all contained in the Lord's Prayer. This prayer is a masterpiece. It has been called the Prayer of Prayers. The Puritan writer Thomas Watson compares it to a a massive heap of gold. John Calvin writes these words. He says, we ought to examine all of our prayers by this prayer. This prayer is the standard, the pattern for all of our prayers. What does Jesus teach us about prayer? How should we pray? Well, I think often what we want, what we'd like, is a formula, a method, a technique, magic words. How to improve your prayer life in 10 easy steps. And if you follow these steps, your prayers will be effective. It's like those instructional videos that you find on YouTube. That's what we want. 
But it's interesting, if you notice here, Jesus doesn't really focus on how to pray. This is not how-to advice. Instead, what you see is the focus is on why we pray. Now, I want to stop here just a moment, hit the pause button. I want to ask you a deep question, an important question. Why do you pray? Not how do you pray, kneeling or standing or silently or out loud. Not how do you pray, but why do you pray? What is your purpose for praying? Do you pray to gain God's favor? Do you pray to climb some spiritual ladder? Do you pray because it's a religious duty? Do you pray to impress other people? Do you pray so God will grant your wishes and desires? Do you pray to perfect your piety? Do you pray so God will bail you out of a crisis? Do you pray because you need health and healing? Do you pray as a relaxation technique? Do you pray to perfect your piety? Do you pray out of, out of guilt? Do you pray as a religious ritual? Do you pray to find inner peace and tranquility? Why do you pray? You see, if we're praying for any of those reasons, then we are not really praying like Jesus. If we're praying for any of those reasons, then we are really we're looking through the wrong end of the telescope. Why do we pray? What is the purpose of prayer? Three things Jesus teaches us. First, the purpose of prayer, the main purpose of prayer is fellowship with God. In verse 9, Jesus prays, Our Father who art in heaven. Now you need to understand in ancient Israel, when the Jewish people prayed, uh, they dared not mention the name of God. The name of God was considered too sacred and too holy and to be spoken by human lips. The Jews had great reverence and respect for God, but the truth is we can't really pray to God unless we know God in a personal relationship. When Jesus prayed, he prayed not to a distant, unknown God. He prayed to his Father, <laughs> our Father who art in heaven. That changes everything. When Jesus prayed, it was intimate. It was personal. He prayed it was a conversation with his Father. In one of his books, Lloyd Ogilvy describes how his son scheduled an appointment to come and see him. And at first, Lloyd Ogilvy was very worried that his son must be in serious trouble to schedule an appointment. But when his son arrived, he sat down with his father and said, Dad, I don't think I've ever really told you how much I love you and how much you mean to me. And so I scheduled this appointment. I'd like to take an hour just to explain why I love you and what you mean to me. For the next hour, Lloyd Ogilvy listened while his son poured out his love for his father. Nothing else. No needs, no requests. Just, Father, I love you. <laughs> Here's why I love you so much. Prayer is like that. To pray like Jesus, it flows out of a deep, personal relationship with God as our Father. Through faith in Christ, God as our Father, we are his children. If you think prayer is just a religious ritual and duty, you have things upside down. If you think that prayer is a tortured spiritual discipline, something you do to gain points with God, we have things upside down. The purpose of prayer is fellowship with God. Second, Jesus tells us the purpose of prayer is surrender. In verse 10, Jesus prays, Father, thy will be done, thy kingdom come, on earth as it is in heaven. With those words, Jesus surrenders completely. He yields himself completely to the will of his Father. I think sometimes when we pray, it's kind of like Aladdin's lamp. You know, if you rub the lamp the right way, the genie will appear and uh, grant you your wishes, give you what you want. But if we pray with that attitude, we have things backwards. If I come to God only with my wish list and my priorities and what I need, really, I'm the one who's in control. My prayer is really self-centered. The purpose of prayer is surrender. 
The night before he went to the cross, Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, Father, not my will, but thy will be done. Not my will, but thy will be done. Jesus prayed that prayer, accepted his Father's will, and went to the cross the next morning. The purpose of prayer is surrender. It's when our spirit and my life is yielded completely to God. It's when I put aside my wish list and my priorities and what I need and what I want, and I simply ask, Father, <laughs> I submit my plans and my future and my life and my finances and my career to you. Use them as you see fit. Use them to build your kingdom. I guarantee if you pray that prayer, surrendering your life daily to Jesus Christ, uh, that will change your life. Finally, the third thing Jesus teaches us is that the purpose of prayer is transformation. Prayer should not just change things, it should change us. In verse 12, Jesus prays, Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. I think there's a great tendency today to externalize evil and sin. When we see everything that's wrong with the world today, we, we blame somebody else, some other group. In our world today, we see a lot of that. We externalize evil. But the gospel tells me I am a sinner. The gospel tells me my own heart is desperately wicked. The gospel tells me before the throne of God, the throne of grace, I must beg for mercy. Father, forgive me. In this cancel culture of revenge and retribution where there is so little forgiveness, where nobody forgives, the gospel tells me I must forgive because I have been forgiven. I must forgive because the Lord Jesus died to forgive me. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. You can spend your whole life praying for God to change the world or change your situation or change your circumstances. But the prayer that really matters is when we pray, Lord, God, change me. <laughs> May I be more loving and forgiving and free from sin and addiction and darkness. And Lord, change me. Take away my pride. Take away my ego. Take away my lust. Take away my addictions. Take away my self-hatred. Lord, I pray, make me more like you. Lord, change me. <laughs> Transform my life. Why do you pray? The purpose of prayer is fellowship with God. The purpose of prayer is surrender. Not, not to get what I want, but to get what God wants in my life. And the purpose of prayer is transformation, that God will change me and mold me, transform me into the image of his Son, Jesus Christ. Will you pray with me? Lord, we thank you again for this great, great gift of prayer. We pray, Lord, this week we would put it to use and put it to practice. And Lord, in our prayer, not merely come with our wish list and our to-do list of things for you to accomplish, but we would, Lord, yield and surrender ourselves to your will. Your kingdom come, your will be done in our lives. And all this we pray in your wonderful name, Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for teaching us how to pray. <laughs> Help us apply these lessons. In your name we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. There's a lot that this world seeks to divide us upon. There's things that separate each one of us in our families, in our communities, in our church in our country, but I ask you this morning to come together on the name of Jesus Christ and declare that you believe that he died and rose again. Will you stand and join me in the Apostles' Creed found in your worship guide? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven 
and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I was just thinking about that famous painting by Michelangelo with Jesus sitting at the center of the table, surrounded by a dozen or so of his friends. When we celebrate the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, what we are doing is we are opening the door and joining Jesus and many others at that very same table. What would we hear? That on the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body broken for you. This morning when you came in at the back on the table, there were these uh, small cups that you were able to pick up. And if you would, let's tear off the top part and take the bread and take it together. The bread of life. And when the supper was ended, he took the cup. Again, when he had given thanks, he gave the cup to his disciples, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. The blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. Lord, what a privilege it will be one day to sit in the fulfilled promise that you said that you would have this meal again in the presence of your people. We thank you, God, for inviting us to the table this morning to witness the breaking of the bread and the pouring of the cup, to proclaim with our own lives and with our own lips that Jesus is Lord, that you died, that you were buried, and that you rose again. Receive our thanks as together with one voice your people pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
they always say, man? Let's say hallelujah this time, okay? And let's say it nice and big and loud so that uh, it's a message from our heart to God. And now, may the love of God and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us forevermore. And all of God's people said, Hallelujah! Hallelujah.